In other words, watch what you say. It's being recorded. All right, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Epistles to the Romans, Romans chapter 8. Very good. So, in another epistle, you don't have to turn there, in the book of Ephesians, it's the same author, the Apostle Paul, and he would encourage Christians to put on the armor of God. But he tells them after naming each piece of the armor and then finally ending with the sword, which represents God's word, he tells them to pray all the time. Why do we need to pray? What you're, you're going to be running for us. Thank, thank you, brother. Why do we need to pray? Or why is prayer important? Why pray? Or well, maybe you don't need to pray. I don't know. Uh, Rose, behind you, Rose. It, it brings us closer to God, helps us to form a personal relationship with Him, and talks to us. Amen. Amen. I like that. If you don't communicate, I mean, that even works on a on a human level. If I don't speak to my wife or to my family, there's no relationship there. So it builds relationship. Let me get Lillian and I saw some other hands. Oh, yeah, Joe and then Alfred. Prayer is uh, having a conversation with God. So yeah. you read his word, that's him communicating with us. And in prayer, we're talking to him. We're having a conversation with him. But why do we need to pray? I mean, I understand have, prayer. Yeah, to have that connection with him. That's the only way you can get to know a person or have a relationship. You have to talk. You have to. So. Amen. Well said. Well said. Joe, Joe Duke. That's how we have fellowship with Christ. Amen. He communicates back. He talks to us. We talk to him. Yes. Amen. Back close to God. Amen. Well said, brother. I think Alfred had his yes. Well, everybody says we want really relationship. And um, I, I can't say no more than communication with God and talking to him and talking to him. But more um and saying what's on your heart. Amen. Well said. Great answers. Great answers. Uh, uh, Marvin, let me get Marvin, then I'll get George. Go ahead, Marvin. All right, so Marvin, for the sake of Zoom, Marvin said that it helps her. She, the reason she prays, it helps her get through the day, through the life's difficulties and connected to God. Very good. Uh, George. Uh, yes, Pastor. The uh, uh, scripture says that, that Satan goes around like a lion devouring who he can find. So we need oh in our daily lives to be able to, to communicate with God and, and uh, to gain strength and victory over so, so many things in life. And it's done, so much of it's done through prayer. Amen. I like that. That's in First Peter 5, 7, and 8, where he actually says, yeah, the lion he goes around like a roaring lion, but he tells us to cast our anxieties on him, right? In prayer. Life is a, is a spiritual battle. Everybody knows that. Life is a spiritual battle. Therefore, it requires spiritual means and spiritual solutions. Every day, whether you're aware of this or not, we are engaged in a spiritual battle. We are battling the devil. We are battling the world, which is against the ways of God. You're also battling with your own flesh. Prayer is hard. It's not, uh, and by that I mean desire to want to pray. Prayer is not easy. You want to humble somebody? 
ask them how their prayer life is. You want to humble a pastor or a deacon or, or a Sunday school teacher or just a Christian, ask them about that. We struggle with prayer. Why is prayer such a struggle? Why is it so hard to pray? Why don't we just pray constantly? Paul tells us to pray, get this, to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5. Why is prayer such a struggle? Or maybe all of you guys pray very easy for you guys. Anyone? Winsom, can you say something? Uh, well, that's one of my answers. Winsome said distractions. I agree. That's a big one. Marvin? Say that again? Lazy? Yes, I got that also. Lazy? Distracted? Yeah? And, um, Jane, hold on for one second. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about prayer. For example, uh, many people think that you need a particular time and place, quiet area at bedtime or early in the morning to pray while you can constantly be in prayer and no one would notice. You know, just pray to yourself and, and your mind. So that's one of the misconceptions about it. Amen. So we, we can pray anytime, right? Uh, by the way, do you have to close your eyes to pray? No. And especially while you're driving, don't close your eyes. Let me get Rosie here. Hold on for one second. Or, um, if I can get you guys on the microphone because they cannot hear you, and I have to repeat if you don't talk on the microphone. All right, I see Jimmy's hand. Hold on. Hold on, Jimmy. I got Rosie. Go ahead, Rosie. Because of what we have heard um, other people do in praying, it seems that we should always be formal. No. We can pray in little ways oh thank you father i crossed the street and they didn't hit me or father i'm going out help me not to hurt anyone or let anyone hurt me just little things like that you know that keeps you constantly praying well said absolutely and that's the that's the praying without ceasing a constant thanking god or requesting uh jimmy ta yeah Kind of goes with the, what the Rosie just said. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, they can uh, do things on their own. They really don't need until something really bad happens. Then they, I, I kind of recruit it like um, as little kids, you know, we think we can do things on our own until it gets too big that we uh, run to mommy and daddy for help. So I think that's the attitude a lot of people have uh, when it comes to uh, prayer. Yeah, well said. Yeah, when we get in trouble, then we look for God, you know? And by the way, God welcomes it. Even when we're in trouble, he wants us to come to him. But we should pray when we're not in trouble as well. Here are my notes. I've got laziness. Uh, I lack the desire. Or I don't have time, right? People say we don't have time. Yet we make time to watch TV. We make time to eat, right? I got no problem with that. We make time to work. We can schedule the time to prayer. It's just not a top priority for us. I put here tired. Sometimes we may start praying and Heavenly Father, I think, right? And maybe the wrong time to pray is in bed, right? You shouldn't be in bed. Get those knees on the floor. Feel that, that hard wood on the floor. That'll wake you up a little bit, right? Um, sometimes I also have distracted. That's a big thing. Also, maybe I don't pray because my heart is cold or my heart is hard towards God, you know, and these things happen when our heart is cold, God is distant and we have zero desire to pray. So um, it's very important that we examine our hearts. And we're going to talk about that. One of the biggest struggles I think many believers have is, um, is not knowing what God wants. When I, come to a fork on the road should i turn left right should i get this job or not should i order this or not should i get a or b and our choices matter they make a difference your choices uh make a difference will affect you your choices will affect your family your loved ones your friends your job your, your will affect others, but also your choices can affect your relationship with God as well. 
and we want to do what God wants us to do. But the question is, what does God want us to do? Can we know? Can we know what to pray for? And that's what today's passage is. The answer is yes. How? And I'm going to give the answer. So once I give the answer, if you want to go home, go ahead and go home, you know? No, 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 no. I want you to stay here. The answer is because God has given us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will direct you. He will direct you because the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. So there's two points I would like to share with you uh, this evening. Number one, I want to talk about our weakness in prayer. Our weakness in prayer. Isn't it interesting when we pray, in essence, I don't know if you ever thought about this. When I'm praying, I'm actually admitting to God that I am weak, that I am unable to meet my needs the way he wants me to meet them. I need God to intervene. And maybe I can do something on my own, but is that the right choice? Is there a better choice? Is there something that will honor God? So what prayer does when we pray, it exposes our weaknesses. Uh, sometimes we're just unsure of what to pray. So let me read verse 26. Today, we're going to look at these two verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Verse 26, Paul writes, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So, here we see that there are times, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes we are unable to express our thoughts to God. I don't know how to phrase it correctly. I don't know if I should say this or that. And sometimes we're, it's just one big mixed emotion that we're experiencing. Or maybe we're in the dark. I don't know. Is this person okay? Or they're not okay? Or are they... Are they dead? Are they alive? Are they lost? Sometimes I just don't know how to pray. And Paul understood this. I don't want to get off the subject, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, is a brilliant man. This guy was a Pharisee, a scholar, an intellect. He was wise. Yet, according to verse 26, he understands that we do not understand, including him. Is there a right way to pray? Is there a correct way to pray? Or it doesn't matter. Let me, let me flip it the other way. Is there a wrong way to pray? How about that? Yes. Okay. Very good. Marvy, can I see Luke chapter 11? Verse 1 and 2 here. Um, here are the disciples. They came up to Jesus. And they wanted to learn how to pray because John the Baptist had shown them. Um, all right, so I'll read it out to you guys. In Luke chapter 11, it says this. And Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John, as John the Baptist, also taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and then you see the, the, uh, the Lord's prayer. The, the purpose of the Lord's prayer is to teach us how to pray. The disciples said, we don't know how to pray. Great question. Teach us to pray. That means there is a right way to pray. And Jesus gave us a model, an example of how to pray. So let me tell you a wrong way to pray. And I'm talking specifically to the Christian, to the believer. The address is crucial. And by the address, I mean, who are we praying to? Does it matter who we are praying to? You better believe it. We're talking to God Almighty. So it's not like, well, the man in the sky, the man upstairs or something like that. There's a proper way of addressing God. Matter of fact, the, the titles of God the names of God describe who he is and his beauty and his magnificence. So how we address God is crucial. Now, 
a person who's not a Christian, uh, I'm assuming God is merciful. He'll hear the prayer. They're saying if there's somebody up there, but for a Christian to pray that way, it's not proper. And Jesus taught his disciples that we can call him Father. Paul says when the Spirit resides in us, he'll lead us to say Abba, Father, or Daddy, or Papi, this term of endearment which means that God is not just our creator, our sustainer, but he is one who loves us and will provide for us and care for us. So how we address God is crucial. Also, not only the address, but the authority. Who gives you the authority to come to God before his throne? Jesus. This is what it means that we do things in the name of Christ. In other words, when we do things by the name of Jesus, why do we say that? Why do people tack that on? And in the name of Jesus, we pray amen, right? We, is that just um, a ritual that you just have to do because everybody does it? No. In the name of simply means by the authority of, right? If you remember back in the day, they say, stop in the name of the law, right? Well, the law doesn't have a name. It's not Mr. Jones or something like that. When it says stop by the name of the law, what that means is by the authority of the law. So the name represents the authority. As Christians, Jesus Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins. We are in right standings with God. And according to Hebrews, we are allowed to approach the throne of grace. Matter, and the King James actually says with boldness. The ESV says with confidence. We can do this, but only by the authority of Jesus Christ. Not only that, we're called to rely on him. When we pray, we're just not casting up, Lord, if you want to do this, do this. We are admitting our weakness, and we're saying, Lord, I am leaning on you. I'm relying on you. I can't do this without you. Matter of fact, maybe I could pick this box up, but Lord, I want you to be with me. Help me. Be with me. Should I do this? We want to lean on God and rely on him for everything. And prayer aligns us with that, with that understanding. Lord, if it's your will, not my will, should I do this? And sometimes we forget these things, but the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit will intervene here. Um, the prayer reminds us also, not only that we are weak, but that we are not in control. God is in control, and we have to learn one thing, and this is very hard. It's always seeking God's will, not my will. God's will is always right, even if you don't understand it. Let me read verse 27. In Romans 8, 27, and he talking about the Father who searches hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to what? The will of God. When you hear the term unanswered prayers, what comes to mind? What's an unanswered prayer? Have you ever had an unanswered prayer? A selfish prayer. Yeah, you think so? No, I don't know. Okay. It's a prayer. It has not been answered my way. That sounds like Mercedes. I can't see. Yes. Mercedes, is that you, Mercedes? Yes, it is. Okay, say it a little bit louder. I'm sorry. I, I thought it is a prayer that it has not be, been answered my way. Yeah, I, I didn't understand her. They heard... Mar uh, Mercedes, I'm hard of hearing. I need hearing aids. Say I'm it sorry. one more time. It is a prayer that has not been answered my way. Yes. Actually, I like that. Very good. Yes. You make a request, and the way you, you've submitted your request, it hasn't been answered according to the way you want it. I like that answer. Great answer. Anybody else? So here's the thing. There's at least three ways that God can answer this. When you submit a, a prayer request, there's at least three ways. One way is God can say yes to your request, right? And that's what we want. We want a yes. 
Another way is God can say no. That's another way. Here's a third way. He can say, wait. How long? I need this now. I need an answer now. And sometimes you just don't know. Am I still waiting? Or did he say no? Or did he answer it another way? This is where things get sticky. But ultimately what we want is his will. And God's will is not our will. His will is always right. In scripture, we have tons, a plethora of examples from Elijah in the Old Testament. Uh, I think about, um, hold, go ahead, um, hold, hold on for one second. Okay. I was just thinking of Jabez when he said, Lord, enlarge my portion. And the Lord did. And that's all there is of Jabez. Yeah. Well, so he had his, his prayer uh, answered. But then you have others that don't have their prayers answered. For example, the Apostle Paul, he had a thorn on his side. Whatever that thorn is, he asked not once, not twice, but three times. And God told him, my grace is what? My grace is sufficient. So his prayer was not answered. I think last week or the week before, I forgot when, on a Sunday morning, we talked about Gethsemane, when Jesus comes to the garden. And Marvy, I, well, I don't know if Marvy, if you're able to pull up um, Matthew 26. If not, it's not a big deal. I have it here. All right, so let me go. Ahead. So in Matthew 26, it says, going a little farther, Jesus fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What's interesting about this, here you have the Son of God talking to God the Father. God the Son talking to God the Father, and they both have two different wills. Do you see that? The Son wants the cup to pass. And he wants to know whether the father will uh, pass the cup. But we know what happens. The father does not pass the cup. So the son in his humanity says, Lord, pass this cup, not as I will, but as you. But notice that Jesus does what? He submits, right? He submits to the, um, to the will of the father. It's a real, it's, there's a real struggle. In Luke's gospel, I find it interesting that Two things happen. Blood comes down, like, you know, from, from the sweat. And then only Luke's gospel records that an angel, a lot of people don't know this, but an angel comes to comfort Jesus. You'll only find that in Luke's gospel. During that time, but the cup is never passed. And there's a reason for that, why Jesus submitted. And I don't think the, um, I think they're having a little bit of trouble up there. So John, I'm going to read this passage. In John 6, 38, Jesus explains his mission. Listen closely. Jesus says in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus is stating here when he says, Lord, pass this cup, not as I will, but as your will. He understands that the will of the Father is the will that is the way to go. It's the perfect will. Um, also in Hebrews 4, verse 15, I, I found this interesting. It says, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. The author of Hebrew is describing Jesus as our high priest. One who has struggled and matter of fact has asked, has submitted prayer requests and has not gotten the request that he wanted. So Jesus understands. He's able to sympathize with you and me in our journey. So we have a high priest who understands us. Are there any questions regarding this? No? Is this clear, I hope? All right. Well, like Jesus... Christians will experience real struggles. Um, they'll also experience real struggles in life. 
but the Holy Spirit will be with us at all times. And Paul assures us here in Romans 8, now we'll go back to Romans here. He assures us that we have the first fruit of the Spirit who's able to bring peace to our hearts. I want to look back to the passage we read last week in verse 23. Romans 8, 23, it says, and not only, I'm sorry, is it, yeah, verse 23, and not only the creation, but ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons and the redemptions of our body. Notice that we receive uh, the first fruits of the Spirit. And the idea here is that, it, like in harvest, like when you gather things, you get the first fruits of everything. And then eventually you get everything else. Last week, we talked about the hope that we get. We got the first fruit of this package, which is the Holy Spirit. Later on, we get everything else, our resurrected bodies and everything. But when we get this first fruit, we have this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God who resides within us, and he gives us power. Do you know that even if something, if you're going through something, say, for example, you lose your job, right? This is your finance we're talking about. You're paying your mortgage, your car payment, and all of a sudden you lose your job and you're going to lose everything. Do you know that you can be at peace with all of that? The natural way is to stress, right? But God can give you a peace in the midst of all these trials, knowing that somehow it's going to work out. Uh, the Holy Spirit can quiet our hearts and can remind us that God is in control. Then in, in verse 26, he talks about groaning, right? Likewise, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, in our weakness. But we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. What does it mean to groan? What is groaning? It means to rejoice, right? All right, let, let me get Pepe. Does groan mean to laugh with joy, right? It's an expression of lament without using words. Oh, I like that. Actually, that, that, I put pain, but I like your answer better. It's an expression of lament. Absolutely. So here's the question. In verse 26, and this may be, uh, sounds like a trick question, because it is, who's groaning? Who's groaning? Okay, uh, I think Rosie has her hand up. In verse 26, who's the one groaning? The Holy Spirit. Okay. No. That's the question. Who's groaning in verse 26? So this is going to be difficult because the answer I can say is I'm not quite sure. Now, I do have an answer, but this is my opinion, and I'll tell you why. Yeah, go ahead, Rosie. Mine says. What translation are you reading from? Um, New American. All right. It, it says, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings yes. too deep for words. And I'm looking at with, because if it's the Holy Spirit, he's groaning with. With who? No, he for Correct. he's interceding for us with groanings right. too for, deep. Right, but the groaning is not attached to the Holy Spirit. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Scholars disagree among each other whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's people, or, or I'm sorry, Christians, whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's Christians, or is it both? And I, I don't know. And by the way, this is my opinion. I could be wrong at this, you know, so I, I want to be clear. I think the person groaning here is the Holy is are Christians, not the Holy Spirit. And here's why I come to that conclusion. Because what's leading to the groaning? According to verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So when, what's causing us to groan here, number one, is our weakness. 
and also ignorance because it says, because we do not know, and that's ignorance. The Holy Spirit is not ignorant, neither is the Holy Spirit weak. In verse 22, we see that believers are groaning, right? In verse 22, it says, for we know that, I'm sorry, the creation groans, pardon. Verse 22 says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. Verse 23, and not only creation, but ourselves who have the first fruit of the, of the spirit. So creation groans and we groan because we are, uh, uh, we're suffering. But does the Holy Spirit groan? I don't think it does. I think the Holy Spirit comes within us and leads us to this groaning, to this awareness. Just like in verse 15, where when the Holy Spirit comes in us, it leads us to cry out, Abba, Father. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I see a bunch of confused looks here. All right, so let me get Alfred first. I like to say, what's the difference in hola and hello? It's the same. Propositionally, it's the same thing, but it's two different languages. Okay. The Holy Spirit speaks a language all to its own that has nothing to do with us, but God himself. We speak a language, whatever one another is, you know, whether you're Greek or you're Russian or whatever you are, we speak a language. Okay, so the Holy Spirit can groan um, to God and that'll be communication because all it is is sound that means something. I mean, Ola is a sound. It's not anything but a sound that you make. And hello is a sound that you make. And if the person who you're in the presence of understands that sound, they know what you mean. So the Holy Spirit. And God knows when the Holy Spirit is groaning. It, God knows what it's talking about because that's the language of God between the Holy Spirit. That's why. I, I mean, that's the way I look at it. Okay. Let me get Rosie. Uh, hold on, Rosie. Hold on. No, no, no. I, I just need you to talk on the mic because we can't. So what you're saying is this. I am groaning because I just don't know how to say it what to say and the holy spirit is now interceding for me Correct. going to god to interpret that groaning that, and mourning that i'm putting that's my interpretation okay. because in verse 26 it talks about what leads us to groan is our weakness and our ignorance that's what verse 26 says it says here Likewise, the Spirit helps us, where? In our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. So these are the things that lead us to groan, not the Spirit, but us. And by the way, there's, a, there's an argument on the other side for the Holy Spirit. This is my interpretation. So I want to be careful and be humble with this. There's certain things we need to be dogmatic about. This is not something that I'm being dogmatic about. It's my interpretation, although I do think it's right. But go ahead, George. As there could it be possible, Jesus in his prayer in the garden could have been groaning. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was I, definitely I, I groaning. I think so. I Absolutely. think so. Absolutely. Yes. I agree with you, brother. Even though it's not worded in that manner, but uh, the way he... He agonized and, and absolutely and uh, suffered Wanted to through that. To be yes. Absolutely. Yes. So in his weakness, in his weakness, he was groaning. And, and when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about in his humanity, right? All right let me get uh, Jimmy Ta. Jimmy Ta, go ahead, brother. All right, Pastor Jim. I am looking at the expanded uh, Bible version, and verse twenty six seems to at least in that version, it kind of backs up what you are saying, because it, this is what it says. But the Spirit himself sp speaks to God for us with deep feelings, 
or groanings that words cannot explain. So it goes back to what the, the other gentleman was saying. You know, it's, we cannot, exp we don't know how to express certain uh, things. So that's why the uh, Holy Spirit uh, speaks on our behalf in, in a, a certain way that uh, God understands, but we are not able to express it. So I, it kind of backs up what you were saying. Yeah, I, I like what you said at the end there. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you, Jimmy Top. Thank you, brother. Let, let me get um, Pepe. Hold on, Pepe. I'm sorry. Hold on. Uh, Pepe's got his hand up. Uh, Pastor. Yes, sir. Um, no, as, as we're, we're talking on this subject, uh, I can't help but think uh, or uh, imagine, let's say, a, a baby. A what? A baby. Oh, a baby. A baby when it's crying. And the, and the parents hear that baby crying. And the, the parents, from the child's crying, even though the child is not expressing anything that we, any words that we would know, but from the lament itself, you can hear if the child is hungry, or if the child is crying from pain of something that's uh, that's pinching them or whatever, but the parent, by the sound of that baby, by, by its groaning, the parent can tell more or less where the ache is. And will minister to the baby yes. as Amen. a loving parent. Amen. So. Amen, I'm with that, yeah. I'm with that. And by the way, uh, I should have presented the other argument as well, because there is another argument that the Holy Spirit's groaning. I just presented this for the lack of time. But let me go ahead and move on here. Um, Paul explains to you that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray in our weakness. That means that he prays with us, and the Holy Spirit also prays for us as well, because we lack wisdom. So for instance, How do I pray if I, like Paul, if I have a thorn in my flesh, okay? Say, for example, I'm diagnosed with some disease. How do you pray? Do I say, Lord, deliver me from this disease, right? Or I could say, Lord, give me strength to handle this disease. Uh, Lord, remove this. Or give me patience. How should I pray? I don't know. But the Holy Spirit does know. And these are some of the mysteries here. He intercedes on our behalf. Do you know in the Old Testament, they had the high priest. And the high priest, his job for Israel was to pray and intercede on behalf of Israel unto God. And that is uh, sort of symbolic of what the Holy Spirit does for us. The high priest, or I should say the Holy Spirit comes and he intercedes for us. Here's another point that I want you to think, and I hope this motivates you to pray more. The, this intercession of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean that the Holy Spirit interfere, in, uh, intercedes? I see it as the Holy Spirit fixes my prayers. Sometimes I say something that's just crazy. I'm not saying it correctly, but the Holy Spirit takes my words and makes them right before God. Sometimes we say things and it may be just wrong, but the Holy Spirit intercedes. He takes my prayers and he makes them right. Sometimes my prayers may be bad, wrong. Sometimes my prayers may be empty and shallow because I'm so distracted. And what I'm saying, I'm not even thinking because I'm so consumed with the issue. And I'm uttering something and the Holy Spirit takes it and makes it right in order for our prayers to be answered. Think about this. You have a child and they're not converted. In other words, they're not a Christian. And something happens to them. Say, for example, they end up in jail. How do you pray for them? 
you say, bless you. Uh, do you say, um, Lord, please get them out of jail? Or do you say, Lord, let them stay in jail so they can find you? I guess it depends. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. I have to be open to God's will, not my will. There's things that I want. But maybe what I want is not best. And sometimes, I don't know if this ever happened to you. I'll pray for something. And I end up with something else that's better. And that's because the Holy Spirit intervened and interceded. Patrick. Hold on for one second. I'm a little hard of hearing. Forget, I'm, one of these days I would get hearing aids. So I know you guys are praying for that. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will intercede and grant me uh, hearing aids. Hold on for one second, Patrick. No, I had a question. Do saints intercede your prayers? Oh, that's a great question, brother. That's a great question. So the answer to that is no. We could pray for each other. And when you talk about saints, I'm using saints in the sense of every Christian is a saint. So if you are born again, we are saints. So we should pray for one another. We can intercede in that sense. But there's when we talk about interceding in the context of mediation, there's only one mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. You know, and there's um, in First Timothy chapter two, verse five, it says there's one mediator between God and man, and that's between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. But that's an excellent question. We should still pray for each other. You know, our people people praying for one another makes a difference. God hears and welcomes our prayers. Um, all right. Is there any questions so far about that? Boy, time is flying quick. I do have a second point. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Hold, hold on for one second. I'm sorry. Just so people in Zoom can hear. One thing that I feel is that when someone else prays with you and for you on your behalf and you're praying for yourself at the same time yeah. is we know that there is strength in numbers Amen. in the anointing in prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not corporate, maybe because it's not a whole room full of, of people praying. However, the word says where two or more are gathered, he's in the midst of their presence. Amen. So, Patrick, I don't know if that's, uh, I think her, her answer is better than mine. I was talking about in the sense of mediation, but saints could pray. If we're talking about saints in the context of the church, yes, the church should be praying for one another, interceding. So I like that. Rosie, hold on for a second. Yeah. Well, just, just wondering if he meant like the, when the Catholics pray to the saints. You right. know, that they it's separate, it's different. Just wondering. Yeah, so if it's referring to the to the context of Roman Catholicism, where you have certain um a certain group of people that are canonized by the Roman Catholic Church as saints, we don't affirm that. Uh that's why I mean that Jesus is the only inter uh he's the only mediator in that sense. But in another sense, it doesn't mean there aren't any saints. Right, First Peter two says that we're all saints, so Christians can pray for one another. All right, go ahead, George. Pastor, I have a question. I don't, I don't know that there have been times when I started my prayer list that I was so anxious mm. to to begin my prayer list. I, I and then uh, there are other times when I approached it and it seemed like a burden to me. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but it's it's a strange happening to me that I'm very anxious to pray over my list. And then sometimes I have to sit myself down and, you know, Lord, give me understanding and so forth. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And, and that happens to, to many of us as well. It could be what we're praying for. Or maybe there's something we put in the back of our mind that's still lingering that needs to be brought forth. Maybe there, there's different reasons for anxiousness for different people, but that happens. But the important thing is we're coming to pray. We're coming to pray. And that's where, uh, that's what we want. 
Uh, so point number one, we talked about our weakness in prayer. Point number two, I want to talk about our reliance on God in prayer, our reliance on God in prayer. And we're, when we are to pray, and I mentioned this earlier, and there's people that want to get things done, right? I'm, I'm one of them. Get, get out of my way. I got things to do. I want to just push forward. And we rely on our own strength. But in prayer, it doesn't work that way. We are relying 100% on God, and you're forced to slow down. And, and I like what George was, was talking about, because the world tells us, don't just stand there, do something. But God tells us, don't just do something, but stand there. Just stop for a moment. Recognize who I am. I am God, and I am in control. And we need to know that sometimes we do need to pause Find a closet, you know, I'm using Jesus' word, find a quiet place and a wait time and just struggle with God, struggle with him and bring our petitions on him. But we have to rely on him. Let me read verse 27. And he who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. All right. So here's this is good because. Can we know anything, or actually, let me back up. Can we know God's will for certain? Can you know God's will for certain? The answer is no. But we don't have to know God's will for certain. Do you know who knows God's will for certain? The Holy Spirit. According to this text, he knows the mind of God. He knows the mind of the Father. Now, there are certain things we do know for certain, right? Salvation through Christ alone. We know that we should pray. We know that we should live holy lives, not sinful lives. Um, we know that we should love one another, right? This is not a mystery. These things we know for certain, but we don't know everything. And Paul's point is, you don't have to know everything. That's the whole setup. You come in your brokenness, in your ignorance, in your weakness. You come to prayer in your mess, and you come before God, and the Holy Spirit who does know will intercede for you. Just pray. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. One thing, I, I got to start wrapping it up here. Let me jump to my last um, minor point here. I don't want you ever to view prayer in fatalistic terms. Does anybody know what fatalism is? All right, um, fatalism, if I can quote uh, Doris Day in her song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, and you know how the song goes, right? Tomorrow's not ours to see, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. In other words, why should I pray? It's going to happen, right? Whatever God does, he's going to do anyway. That is unbiblical. There's many passages. For example, I think about James 4.2. James tells us, you have not received. Why not? Because you have not asked. So therefore, if you don't ask and you don't receive, if you don't pray, the outcome would have been radically different had you prayed. Prayer makes a difference. And sometimes you have not received because you have not come before your loving father. Prayer makes a difference. Do not assume this fatalistic concept uh who who knows god's going to do whatever my what i say doesn't matter that's false jesus is constantly praying jesus also welcomes us to pray if jesus who's the greatest theologian of all if he understood that prayer works that's why he tells us if prayer did not work he would have told us that jesus would say listen don't pray because it doesn't matter Right, Jesus would know out of all people, but Jesus tells us to pray because it does make a difference. When we pray, sometimes, and by the way, here's a, a few other things I want to mention. When we pray, it's always wise to examine our hearts. Maybe God is going to answer our prayers, but maybe there's a few things we need to take care of first. Maybe God says, Albert, I will answer that but there's a sin issue you have to first deal with. 
or maybe there's a circumstance I have to handle and help out before he answers this. This is why it forces me to pray and say, Lord, tell me why isn't this being answered? Through the Holy Spirit, he'll reveal it to you. We need to look within and we need to struggle. We need to struggle. Prayer often leads to struggle. Jesus struggled on the Garden of Gethsemane. He struggled often when he prayed, when he was about to do something great. I think about the great Martin Luther, um, the night before the Diet of Warps, where his life was at stake, and he struggled for hours. He wrote out his prayers, and you can read these prayers that he wrote. And yeah, we have to struggle. So that being stated, um, the, I want to end by saying that the Holy Spirit ministry is to help us to pray, and he's going to reveal to you how to pray. So the, the goal here is to understand that there's power in prayer. Are there any questions before we close out? Rosie? This is not so much a question, but there are times when I don't feel like praying. I don't want to pray. And yet I start praying. I pray because I know this is what I am supposed to do. So I pray. And here is the difference. The minute I start praying and just give him, give him his due, worshiping him, there is a difference. There is a change in me who didn't want to pray at that moment. Amen. Well said. I think I saw Walter's hand up. Yes. Hi. I have a question. Um, in John 14, uh, verse 13 and 14, it says, um, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Mm. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. 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 Now, I, keep in I mind. I don't know what's, what's the meaning of uh, those two verses, because I know we, you know, uh, God does what he pleases. Right. So notice, uh, I'm going to read exactly what you stated here. Um, let me read verse 12 and 13 carefully. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, that is in Jesus, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask, uh, I'm sorry, whatever you ask in my name, what does it mean to ask in the name of Jesus? Remember, we talked about that. By his authority. So I'm going to use an extreme example here just to make the point. I like this car here. You know, Jessica, I like Jessica's car. When Jessica goes over there, Lord, I pray I can steal her car. Of course, that is silly. In the name of Jesus, right, I'm going to sin and steal a car. Or I'm going to steal Rosie's thing over there or whatever. You can't do that. So you have to know if you're going to do something by the authority of Christ, you're doing God's will. So the whole point, if you do something, if you seek out his will, yeah, ask, ask away. He's saying whatever you want as a loving father, he wants to bless us. And I think also when you connect it to the Romans passage, what if I don't know? I use an extreme example by, by saying about stealing. Let me use something a little bit lighter. What if, and I know I'm married, but if I was a single guy and, you know, should I date this woman here or not? You know, how do I know? Lord, make it real. And God, sometimes we read his word. There's certain principles there. It has to be within his context. Does God want me to date a non-believer? The answer is no. We'll be unequally yoked. But, if, but maybe she's a believer, but she's not the right one. And this is where it gets tricky, but ask. He says, ask, whatever you want, I'll give to you. And he may remove this person and bring somebody else. So there is, I think there's a lot of gray areas in tension because God wants you to draw to him. And there's, there's beauty there and there's struggle. There, there really is. All right, any, any other questions? All right, very good. So uh, let me go ahead and um, conclude in prayer. And, and then... Uh, Boy, it's cold in here, isn't it? Just kidding. I know it's hot. Uh, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for today. And I pray 
that today may be the beginning of something good for many of us, for all of us, Lord, that we can begin seeking your face. Lord, I know there's a lot of things that hinder our hearts from praying to you. Maybe unforgiveness. Maybe there's toxic things that we watch that hinders our desire to be with you because you are holy. So I ask, Lord, that you detox us, detox our hearts, our minds, clean it out. Allow us to see, Lord, that we are weak, that we need to lean on you and rely on you. Remind us, Lord, that your will is always right. And even when we disagree, Lord, for us to learn to accept your view and to keep seeking your face. Thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned us, that you've given us your spirit to reside in us, to lead us to you in prayer. Give us that taste, that enjoyment of being in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the saints that have gathered here to, today physically to, uh, to learn your word. We thank you for those who are on Zoom that made the effort to join us, Lord. Bless us all. In the name of Jesus, by his authority, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kim and Kalia. Thank you both for coming, Kim and Kalia. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. Very good. Um, Donna, thank you, Donna, for joining us. You're very welcome, Pastor. Thank you. Jackie, thank you, Jackie, for joining us. Very good. Uh, Jean, thank you, Jean, for joining us. All right. Uh, Mercedes and Charlie. Thank you, Mercedes yeah. and Charlie. Yeah, you guys get a double wave. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Patricia, thank you, Patricia, for joining us. Thank you, Pat. You're very welcome. Have a good evening. God bless Have you. Stay Sunday. Thank you. Uh, Jaime, thank you, Jaime, for joining us. All right. Uh, Jimmy Ta, thank you, Jimmy, for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Alexei, thank you, Alexei, for joining us. Thank you, Pastor Alba. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Carol, for joining us. All right, Carol. Um, also, Sonia, thank you, Sonia, for joining us. All right, very good. I want to thank you guys. Thank for, you. For, ah, there you go. Hi, man. Good to hear your voice. Thank brother. you, Pastor. Thank I love you. God bless you, brother. Thank you. All right, everybody here, thank you guys so much. You are dismissed. Thank, thank you, you, Pastor. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.